working from home means every day is bring your kid to work day. And if you don't have the right tools and mindset to balance work and family responsibilities, you may end up throwing in the towel. Black Moth Radio gives you the upper hand in starting and managing your ideal lifestyle while creating your own business, doing what you do best, and doing it from home. So, grab the nearest ink pen and prepare to take notes, because this show is packed with discoveries, tips, and experiences to help you through your journey. Let's begin with our host, Robin Bull. Hey everyone, and welcome to Black Moth Radio, where we make working from home work for you, and where it's pretty much always bring your kid to work day when you work from home. I am your host, Robin Bull, and I am joined by my co-host, Danny Bull, and our three dogs who are somewhat clingy and partially annoying today. So, this is actually take two for this particular recording. (laughs) So, um... Going to be answering questions that were sent to me through Quora and through Facebook Messenger. We're going to talk about why people are scared to hire freelancers. How can I become a successful freelance writer? Which freelance sites are the best for beginners? Is Upwork worth the hassle? And no, it's not what you're thinking it is, Danny Bull. I know. You want to tell people what you thought it was? I thought a lot of people probably had trouble with those qualification test but apparently that's not it on this one that's not it and and we'll make sure that people know what it is and um, then we'll talk about what you can do if you're building your freelance career in a creative I don't know what to call it creative area doesn't really matter if it's art writing music or whatever you win a competition they want to use your entry for their project and they then want to pay you a commission on sales we'll talk about what you can do to protect yourself too so I'm gonna start first with why people are scared to hire freelancers and um, I was asked this just the other day through Cora and the answer boils down to trust it is nearly impossible for a client to have total assurance that a freelancer is who they say they are that they have the credentials or experience they claim to have, that they know their project will be completed on time, or that the freelancer won't steal their ideas. So as a freelancer, it's up to you to find ways to inspire trust. Some ways that you can do that include not bidding on projects that you're not qualified to handle. Don't tell a potential client that you're going to handle a project if you plan to outsource it to another person. For example, you're starting an agency, you kind of just source the work and then you assign it to other people that you work with. If you're going to do that, if you're going to outsource a project, you need to make sure the potential client knows and that they're okay with this. You can offer to meet the potential client through Skype, Google Hangout, Upwork, video chat, some other form of online conferencing that uses a webcam. This helps potential clients put a face to a name and it helps reassure them that you understand and speak their language. People aren't always looking for a native speaker necessarily, but I can't tell you how many times I've been on something and the client went with someone else because there's a lower rate and then they come back to me later because, you know, the person they relied on wrote it in their native tongue and then used Google Translate to uh, translate it over or they didn't really understand the client's needs because there's a language barrier. We've seen that happen with entire eBooks. Yeah. (laughs) It's pretty scary. Um, You could give out a couple of free tips when you're sending out your proposal. Don't use generic crap that they can find in a published article. Give tips that are based on your experience as a professional. Make sure those tips are specific to their needs. That's actually something that I do. When I send out proposals, I will either give them one or two tips that could help them regardless of if they hire me or someone else, or especially if I may not be all that interested after hearing totally what they need done, even if I decide to decline it, I will tell them, in my experience, where the biggest problem usually comes up in their projects so that they know what to watch out for because I want them to have enough information that they're able to make educated decisions about the project. And if you're so new that you don't have any tips, go on to a local forum or if you have a friend that's also freelancing, ask them. 
yeah, do something to learn about it. Um, because, for instance, when people hire me for SEO writing, and or they want to talk to me about SEO writing, I don't go directly into the make sure you use keywords no more than you know whatever the current density rate is because they could actually find that just by googling they could find that if they read SEO journal um, there's a lot of places they can get that basic information and so instead especially if I work with lawyers um, I will talk to them a little bit about keyword semantics because the current trend according to something in SEO journal that was released relatively recently although it's always been a little bit of a trend I noticed it quite some time ago you don't need one single page for every single keyword that you want to use so if you're a lawyer family lawyer in Chicago you don't need a page for family lawyer in Chicago and then a separate page for uh, Chicago family lawyer those are very similar and you're going to rank for both keywords and there's a way to fit them both actually into your page to uh, you know if, if that's what you really want to do um, and of course I always tell them make sure that your content is valuable to the reader don't make it just incredibly bare bones because you can actually get penalized if Google doesn't think that your content is uh, worth the readers time so moving on um, oh, one final note about that. It really does just take one bad experience or someone hearing or reading about a bad freelance experience to make people afraid to hire someone. So that is actually another reason why you probably shouldn't go and bid on stuff you're not qualified to do in some way because if you're not able to complete the gig, if you don't have the confidence or the knowledge to complete the gig, you're really just setting the rest of us up for a problem in the future and that includes you because the longer that you are a freelancer you'll start experiencing that as well people don't want want to hire you because they had a bad experience with someone else so don't be that guy there are three fat people on TV fighting each other with cake it's funny in a wedding dress that part's fairly irrelevant it's the fact that they're all three overweight and like hitting each other with cake <laughs> Guess what we're watching? <laughs> okay, so the next couple of questions came together, again, through Quora. How can I become a successful freelance writer, and which freelance sites are best for beginners? So, there are several steps to become a freelance writer, a successful one, and it certainly helps to have certain characteristics or to learn certain skills like time management and self-discipline. Yes, those can be learned. Past that, you need to have some writing samples that you can show to potential clients. When I first started, I did not have any samples that I felt at the time would interest potential clients. Of course, hindsight being 2020, looking back, I was wrong based on my current client demographic. Yeah. Most of what I did um, as a paralegal and a college instructor, I definitely could have used. So it is what it is. What I did though, I started a Hub Pages account for free. And um, the thing was at the time, Hub Pages made this big to do about how you could get paid for writing content. And it's all ad based Google Ads, whatever. Um, you don't earn a whole lot of money. I think I earned two or three cents a week. I was never able to cash out, but that's okay because it's a free place that gets decent traffic that you can go and set up some samples. So, because it makes it look like that you have an official byline, and a lot of people don't understand that's how Hub Pages works is, you know, writing content and the ads involved. But the really cool thing about Hub Pages is. You can log in to the back area once you've signed up and um, they have a forum and you can go through there and you can read about different topic ideas that people have that maybe they don't want to write about so they just toss it out there in the forum for whoever wants it or you can even just go through on hub pages read different articles um, if they're if you think you could write it better and I'm not saying that you're a better writer than the other person but you have a little bit more of something to add or you have a different take, you could start your article that way. 
I also would write about things that I knew about. I wrote about contracts. I wrote about um, conflict management. So there are a lot of different things that I was able to write about. And the thing was that I kept in mind that I am I was ultimately doing this as something I could show people my skills in writing. So I also started a blog at that time. I don't have many posts from that first blog that I continue to use. The ones that I use, I moved over to a Wix site. And every once in a while, I will direct a potential client over there to see a couple of things or people will actually find me through that site. So um, I was on Upwork when it was still Odesk and uh, I was on Elance, which is defunct and owned now by Odesk slash Upwork. Completed my profile, started applying to things that I knew I could do. That to me was important in becoming a freelance writer because I knew that I needed to build that confidence and also have some verifiable experience on the platform. Does Upwork still have the testing? They do. And the thing is, just like it was back when it was Odesk, the only test that you have to take and pass to be able to apply is their readiness test. Right. The rest of them are just something that you can take to show potential clients that you at least know a little bit of what you're talking about. And they give you the opportunity to turn off, you know, make it to where people can't see them on your profile. You can turn off the tests that you didn't do very well on. Um, the tests are good. I, I took quite a few of them. I haven't bothered to take any of them in years, though. Because oh, yeah. when they were owned by Odesk, it seemed like on some of them, the answers were very, very subjective. Or they were outdated. Yeah. So, um, you got to kind of... When working in the office, is it okay to smack a girl on the butt to tell her she did a good job? Yes. Well, they had, <laughs> they, they had other customer service questions that were seriously outdated. Yeah. When, um, when talking to... An, to a black man. No, <laughs> they weren't that? that bad. No, they weren't that bad. <laughs> so. What the hell? <laughs> but my first job actually was through Odesk, and it was a demand letter. I was so proud for that 15 whole dollar contract uh, there. I, I was remember. so proud. <laughs> and for the same client, not too long after that, I edited a paper that he wanted to submit to an American law journal. He was Canadian, so he wanted to make sure that his spelling of certain words matched our American spelling instead of the way they spell certain words in Canada. So the first couple of things I landed on Elance were legal writing jobs. There was one that was summarizing news articles and one where I was writing page content. I was stunned when I got those because it never really dawned on me that lawyers didn't write their own content. Because lawyers know how to write. Like, you literally go to law school for three or four years, depending on if you're full-time or part-time. And that, aside from learning the law, that is the crux of your education. You are learning how to write something very specific in a specific way. One client didn't pay me. One, the lawyer, is actually a content production company. Um, but I wasn't going to sit there and chase down 20 bucks right. at that time. I thought that was stupid. So I just didn't work with them anymore, and I left them bad feedback. But to be fair, my feedback that I left was professional. I didn't curse them out. You know, people look at that. They look at the feedback. So it's important to talk about it in the right way. So the next thing I did to become a successful freelance writer, I filled up my schedule at a certain hourly rate, which was fairly low. Um, even with my credentials, like looking back, I should have charged more, but it got me the experience that I needed on my profile to be able to kind of feel more confident and to show clients that, yeah, she's working, she's doing what she needs to do. Again, it, it goes back to that thing we talked about with trust. It was the same with the flat rate work. Yeah, because now aren't you like one of the, in the top 1% of their... I am considered top rated. Yep. And, um... So what I do is I, I fill up my schedule at a certain rate. Um, and when I am considering flat rate projects, I have, because I have experience, I, I generally know how long something will take me. I look at the amount they're offering. I do the math and decide if it would equate to write about what I get hourly or more. And if it doesn't, and, you know, I send a proposal with a different budget and they tell me it's too expensive, well, then I guess we're just not working together. <laughs> 
Unless I really, really like the project. Um, that hasn't happened in a while, though. But I, I still charge fairly reasonable rates for hourly and flat rate work. <laughs> Compared to that guy who does like $100 an hour. Or... Oh, I know lots of people that do that, and they do okay. Yeah. They, they don't work as much as I do, but, you know, I like I like working. So, <laughs> And my flat rate stuff, when you do the math, I average probably double or triple my hourly rate. Who's, who's so. the mom with the dogs now? Panda's giving me a hug. She's not trying to bite me. The other one is. No, she's biting oh. Crom, and Crom is licking her to death. Um, but once I got my schedule fairly full at a certain hourly rate, I upped my rate. And part of that was I saw it as a strategy to slow down the amount of work that was coming in. But when I kept getting <laughs> requests at the higher rate, I would go back and find clients at the lower rate that... I currently, you know, there was nothing active. We hadn't worked together in a while. hadn't heard from them. I close out the contract. I, I leave them good feedback and I close it out. Right. And I have some repeat clients and I will message them first and say, I haven't talked to you for a while. If you need me, let me know. I will honor our previous rate. If it's reasonable, you know. Um, Penn Foster is one of those I continue to honor my rate for. But anytime I've yeah, I don't, I don't think you're doing the $12, 12 an hour no. thing anymore, are you? No, but like the last few times I've bumped up my rate, I've told them that I would honor my previous rate with them. Yeah. And they're like, they no, always... no, no, you deserve this rate. And I'm yeah. Like, okay, great. Go, oh, no. Go ahead. Yeah, so that's important too, though. If you have repeat clients that mean a lot to your business, make sure that you work with them, you know. So... The thing is, though, it's not just what you charge. The real secret in creating a successful business in terms of creating referrals, because most of my business now, at least outside of Upwork, comes from referrals. Most of my Upwork business is repeat business, or they see my profile while they're looking around and they see all the hours I've worked and how long I've been there and the feedback that I'm top rated and all this. So the real secret is how you treat your clients. You have to treat your clients like they matter because they do. And a $10 client who takes up five minutes of your time is just as important from a customer service perspective as your biggest client. Why? Because they've contracted you through the internet and all it takes is a few negative reviews or social media posts about how you don't answer emails or respond in a timely manner to make people not want to do business with you. And I've seen that happen to so many people. And and generally those freelancers, they're, well, but this is about me working on my own time. And I, I did this because I wanted freedom with my schedule. Well, yeah, but if you're doing this because you want to travel, cool. I know people that do that. I, I know expats that actually travel abroad and work. Um, the thing to keep in mind, though, is they let clients know the days they're going to be traveling, when they will be totally unavailable. They get their shit done before they travel if they're going to be unavailable. And they also set certain hours where they answer emails, phone calls, whatever it is. And I, I keep those certain hours, too. Um, as far as the best websites for freelancers starting out, I still recommend Upwork. I've used people per hour too. It's okay. Um, they kind of changed how they were working. I, I kind of hope they've changed back, but I haven't looked. But Upwork is definitely my preferred site. Thumbtack is all right if you're looking for things in your area. I get a lot of requests for people within driving distance wanting to talk to me about SEO writing, copywriting, because I do a lot of copy work, um, various things, but the problem with Thumbtack, especially if you're new to freelancing, you know, you may not be looking to dump money into your business right now, and with Thumbtack, as my husband also knows, you have to buy credits. And it's not one or two credits to talk to somebody. No, it can be all the way up to like... Twelve. I thought twenty was the max now. Well, what I have seen, it's... Like when I, I don't even check my account anymore. It was between, the average was between 8 and 12 credits. And the credits weren't cheap. It's not like you spent 5 no. bucks for 100 credits. Yeah, and, no. You know. You spent 5 bucks for like 10 credits and then 
ten dollars got you twenty five and which really sucks if you know they're charging you between eight and twenty credits just to talk to one person for something that you don't really know for sure that it's going to pan out because yeah. that is the thing about freelancing like now I, I can look at a job and tell you whether or not I could talk to someone one time and land the job um, but just starting out that's not something that you necessarily know how to do unless you have a background in sales so Upwork is my preferred I, I actually I stay away from freelancer.com um, I looked at it in the beginning I thought some of it was kind of neat like you earn it was kind of like playing an online game you earn certain experience points and you leveled up and, and crap like that but never ever 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 did I find something that was worth my time or money and just as so some of you know once you get top rated status at least in writing and editing um, just so y'all know Microsoft does a lot of their freelance temp hiring through Upwork I know this by experience because I get sent <laughs> things all the time. Um, I don't work with them. Just just to clarify, I don't work with Microsoft. I don't have a grudge against them. I use my online Microsoft account all the freaking time. I just don't work with them. Um, I have enough to do. So, And to work with Microsoft, there's actually a lot of extra paperwork that you have to do. So I don't do it because it's just not my thing. But, hey, if you're interested in working with Microsoft or other companies like that, Upwork is the place to be. And I am not affiliated with Upwork outside of the fact that I use their platform. They don't pay me to talk about them. They don't, you know, no. In fact, we've had our fair share of Upwork, what in the hell do you think you're doing moments. But anytime I've had to call or otherwise contact support, they've always been great. So... Speaking of Upwork, that brings me to another question from the mailbag. Is Upwork worth the hassle? So, you know, earlier you, you mentioned that you thought that maybe they were talking about the tests. Yeah. Because the tests are kind of a pain in the butt. Um, specifically, though, the person that was asking this question was referring to the fees that Upwork charges when you get paid. Um... It's, really? That's it? It's free to sign up for Upwork. It's free to complete your account to get it verified. It's free to do all of these things. You get charged a fee on the money that you make. Um, and it seems like that there are a lot of people complaining about this. Upwork is the only freelance marketplace that I am active on. Yes, even though they have a fee. I have the free account. I don't, you, you can have a paid account and pay extra for application credits, too. I used to. I don't do that anymore. The price was fine. I didn't have an issue with that. I got the extra bids. It gave me access to other information, like how many people applied, what their bid rates were. Like, you get some good information from that if you need it. Um, but not all of my clients are on Upwork. I have private clients, too. So the thing about those fees, it's and, and I'll tell you about them in a minute, but it's important to keep in mind that the fees that Upwork charges covers their overhead. Upwork has bills to pay, just like we do as freelancers. They curate the jobs. You know, they have a customer support team. They have a freelance support team. So they, they pay to host this site. They go out there. They source the jobs. They get people to put the projects on there. So if you're bitching about a fee, you're bitching about, you, you probably don't belong in business. You really don't. Starting out. Because it's not that much. It's only like 10%, isn't it? Well, starting out, most contracts now have a fee of 20%. That's right. They upped it. Right. That comes out and goes to Upwork. So the thing is, so if you have a contract that, that's a repeat client, once you hit the $500 mark with the client, and it is not that hard to do, if you have a repeat client, your fee then goes down to 10%. Once you hit another higher dollar amount, I can't remember what it is though, your fee goes down to 5%. I actually have one or two clients with that 5% fee instead of the 10 and 20%. From my experience, what I have learned about people who complain about the fee, and it doesn't matter if it's 20, 10, or 5%, they're complaining because they're not making money 
on Upwork because they can't get the jobs or they don't understand how to properly price their projects or their hourly rate in a way that makes it easier for them to absorb that fee as a cost of doing business. So another complaint that I hear is you only get so many bids. You know, you can only submit to so many things. Well, yeah. Um, but the thing to keep in mind there, you have to think about it as a mechanism that makes you stop and think about whether you really understand the scope of a project have and have the experience to handle it before you make your bid. That's just kind of how I feel about that. So, I mean, you've used the Upwork platform before. Yeah, you're right. You've there, there's not. It's not difficult. It's not. You're right. You, you need to be looking and seeing whether or not you are capable of doing the job. That's really all it is. If you're right. not capable and you're not able to do it don't do it don't bid on it don't waste your credits on it be honest with yourself so then the final question that i got actually came to me through facebook messenger yesterday if you win a contest if you're an artist or a musician um graphic designer insert creative craft whatever here okay and you win a contest that you entered online and the company contacts you or the person contacts you and says we want to use your insert entry here in our project uh, and we're going to pay you a commission how can you protect yourself and how can you know that they're legitimate so basically it, it boils down to first you need to make sure that they're legitimate and one way that you can do that is first by very politely asking them their business name if they have one because I, I know not everybody has a registered LLC or a corporation partnership whatever never hurts to ask if they have one get the name find out what state they're registered in um, look them up and the reason why you want to look them up through the Secretary of State website is to make sure that they are active. More importantly, even if it says that they are inactive, inactive doesn't mean that they got in trouble. Words like suspended yeah. means they're in trouble. <laughs> suspended, exiled, deported, things like that. Well, generally the most common suspension is I don't because... Think they use deporting for business, but you know what I mean. Suspension is generally... Most common if they're not paying their taxes in some way, like especially if they have to pay state taxes because of what they do. Um, so that's step one. Step two, just use the internet to your advantage. Look up their business and their name or names on social media. And what you're looking for is more that you know they're not out there you're, you're not seeing a lot of complaints from other people so and so said they were gonna pay me and didn't or um, you know Danny is laughing because the pit bull is under the table and I'm sitting in the floor and he's desperately trying to climb into my lap and has turned over on his back has his paws on the edge of the table and is trying to pull himself into my lap mm -hmm. It's pretty funny. Um, In my defense, I tried to help. So, if you do find people talking negatively about the people involved on the current project, previous project, whatever, read it and take it for what it is. You could even do your own research on the person who left the comment because some people have nothing better to do than to try to destroy others. I've worked with clients who, when I looked them up, they had pretty scary history um, that was public record. And yeah. But then when you dig into it a little further, you find that they were found not guilty, that it ended up being someone who was just angry and trying to make trouble. Like, there's there are a lot of caveats to consider. You also have to go with your gut. If you think that something is weird or doesn't feel right, it probably isn't right. So... How can you protect yourself? How can you make sure that you get paid? Um, the easiest 
way to go about it. Number one, there's no absolute 100% way to ensure that you are paid, especially if you're doing this on commission. Um, especially with commission, because if they're paying you up front for a project, you know, you're good. You know, you're getting at least some of your money. You could do a retainer. With commission, it's different because they're either... Depends on, I guess, how they're going to define commission. And that's something else that's important. By commission, are they commissioning you and going to pay you in advance for a piece of work? Or pay you a certain amount when it's finished? Or are they going to pay you a commission on the sales of whatever it is you're contributing to? That's important. Um... And the reason it's important is because I know that in certain creative areas, the word commission is used more in one way than in the other. So right. you got to get that definition. you got to really understand. You need to know what they're going to pay you, what they're offering to pay you. Create or get a contract. If it is the type of commission where they plan to just pay you outright for work, either in the beginning or at the end, ask for a retainer fee. It doesn't even have to be a very big fee. It's just sort of an amount that is given to you to promise that they're going to pay. Um, the thing is, if you don't complete the work, you may have to return that fee. So get a contract. If they offer you a contract, read it. Make sure you understand what's in there. If you don't understand what's in there, you need to talk to a business manager to find out what's going on. Or even an attorney. But, you know, business managers can sometimes be a little bit less expensive for stuff like that. Um, so yeah, make sure you have a contract and you understand the terms. You look like you want to say something. Well, I was just going to bring up an instance. I had a buddy of mine that entered a poem they had written into a poetry contest. And Those poetry contests are generally bunk, by the way, at least for the Poetry Society. Not not magazines, yeah, not no. books, not, not things like the, that. The, this one was for a book, but... The, and they pay they An said anthology. They gonna, yeah yeah um and they were going to pay a commission but what they didn't put in their contract and he ended up having to go take them to court is they only paid out their commission per thousand sales yeah so he got one check well they made they sold like 1980 of the books but they never put in the contract that he wasn't going to get paid for the other 980 because it never showed, it never got. Because it didn't hit their their mark. Yeah, it didn't hit their mark, but it wasn't in their contract, so he ended up having to take them to court. He didn't understand that because they sold the first thousand within thirty days, so he got that first check pretty that quick. First, first check really quick, and yeah. then the second one never showed up. So just make sure, even afterwards, that you're staying on top of your commission. They, you know, if it's commission, whatever sort of payment, of yeah, whatever sort of payment it is, you do, you have to stay on top of it because if you're not getting paid, that's yeah. a problem. And and it's not a bad question to ask. Hey, is this per hundred, five hundred thousand copies sold? That's not a bad question to ask. It's just you trying to make sure beforehand that you understand what's going on and that you can live with that. Yeah. I mean, that's important to you. The, the more questions you ask, the more comfortable they'll be and most times. If they're not comfortable answering the questions, you probably don't need to be dealing yeah. commission with those people. That's kind of a red flag that they're being a little shady. If they get, especially if they get defensive. It's one thing if someone says, because they're just maybe a representative, of, oh, I'm not sure, let me find out. And then they legitimately get back to you. That's fine. I don't have an issue with that. My issue comes up where they start getting defensive when you ask questions. So, and, um, you know, if you do have an asshole, you're not sure what's going on, whatever. We, You you and I do ta tend to handle these contracts for people from time to time. Oh, yeah. I mean, we we charge a little bit of money because, you know, it's time it takes over time. Day, and it, it takes a lot of work to deal with these people. But, yeah, if you're having the trouble, email us, message us on Facebook. Or message Robin on Facebook. Twitter, whatever. And, We're around. And, you know. <laughs> LinkedIn. Yeah, as long as, long as it's legitimate. You um, know, I'm even willing to look at contracts to let you know whether or not it's... Yeah, looking at contracts prior to signing and things yeah. like that. It's, you know... But 
for us to look at your contract, you first have to sign ours because I don't want to get sued. <laughs> yes. And that's the other thing, though, speaking of being sued and getting paid and all that. Yeah, if you don't get paid, you you could start a lawsuit. The thing to keep in mind is even if you represent yourself, there's still money that you're going to put out for that. Um, so you have to stop and consider whether or not what is owed to you is really worth the court fees, the fee of an attorney, your time, whatever it is it's, you know, you're dealing with. So that's just something else to consider. Never yeah, really hurts to have an attorney on retainer, actually. Just, you know, save up a couple thousand dollars, get yourself a civil attorney, and just explain to them what you're needing. You know, get yourself a business attorney or a collections attorney, whatever. Explain to them what you're needing and put down a retainer so that they're there if you do need something like this done. Yeah. Um, I think I think that buddy of mine that had the problem with the poetry book ended up going through arbitration instead of going to, like, civil court. I bet that was in his contract, too. You can't sue us. You have to go through arbitration. Yeah, but, I mean, kind of the neat thing about arbitration is they don't have a choice. They kind of have to pay. No, they don't. Hmm. An arbitrator is a third party, kind of like a judge, but not a judge. Sometimes they are retired judges, um, but the arbitrator basically listens to both sides, and um, the arbitrator makes a decision about what will happen as far as the problem, and it is legally binding. So whatever the, arbitrator, the, mic. whatever the arbitrator decides is going to be done, that's legally binding. You don't get your day in court. That's it. That's the difference between arbitration and mediation. If you go to mediation, you don't like uh, the outcome of mediation, you can go to court. Is it media which one is it that you be, you pretty much have to have your money up front? Both of them. Okay. You have to pay your arbitrator or mediator up front. No, I meant they like require like if you're suing, whoever's getting sued has to have the money there with them. Neither. Oh. Like there's no generally unless it's written into the contract or something, there's not a requirement for that usually. So Unless the judge says you're going to arbitration, then the rules may change, but I don't know. I don't know. It, it might have been. I know it took them about three years to get it all taken care of. Yeah. It's, but they ended up also having to pay the court costs and all the other crap because it was, it was found that they didn't put in the contract. And, yeah. Well, they didn't even bother to really let him know, so... Yeah, no, well, there may have, you know. And he, that's the thing that... This buddy of mine was kind of a big drinker back then. He may have been talking to him when he was drunk and forgot. Here's the other thing, though. As a freelancer, as a professional, insert what you do here, artist, musician, graphic designer. I'm, I don't do those things, so, you know, I'm not super creative in those ways. It is your obligation for your business to make sure that you understand what is going on, how you're going to get paid, when you're going to get paid. You know, it's, it's your duty. It's your job to ask these questions and find out. Don't ever, 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 ever rely on the other person to make sure they're telling you the truth because there are a lot of honest people out there, but there are also a lot of people that aren't. So that's all I got. You got anything else? Nope. Well, Thank you so much, everyone. Don't do drugs. Us. There we go. There's my two cents. Do you want to say it like Mr. T or anything? No, I suck at Mr. T impression. <laughs> Thanks so much. Give a fool. <laughs> Thanks See. so much. You done? I thought I'd wait till your mid-sentence again. Just kidding. Join us on confessionsfromthecouch.com. Make sure that you subscribe and join almost 1,600 other people. Who enjoy my ranting, my raving, my tips, my funny stories like our niece who doesn't believe in dinosaurs. Oh, God. Yeah, that, that's, um, we're not going to tell you about it. You have to go to confessionsfromthecouch.com. Find the blog post for that. Here's a hint in case you're listening to this much later after the date that it's posted on Podbean. It's for January 2018. That'll help you find it. You can just look in the archives. You know, in case someone's listening to this in the middle of the summer or whatever. Right? Right. Uh, you can find us on 
Facebook, facebook.com slash the Robin Bull. Twitter, twitter.com slash the Robin Bull. I'm also on LinkedIn, same name. And um, I guess that's all we have for you. Hopefully, you're walking away from this podcast with a plan to implement the tips you've heard, a great attitude, and you subscribe to Black Moth Radio to ensure that you never miss any of the goods. Whether you're a hopeful work-from-home freelancer or you're well settled into your work-from-home lifestyle, we hope you've learned something that you can use. If you're ready to more about the work-from-home lifestyle, check out cellfy.com slash Bull. Questions, comments? Let Robin know by going to facebook.com slash the Robin Bull or confessionsfromthecouch.com. Thanks for listening. Join us next time and keep learning.